here are our judges, and we're doing it in alphabetical order. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Clint Cope. I'm VP of Engineering at Elroy Air. Um, we're an aerospace company located here in San Francisco, California. Uh, on behalf of our team, thanks for having us. It's good to be here. And I thought we'd kick things off with a brief video about the company. Worldwide demand for fast and flexible delivery of goods is forcing logistics to adapt. The need for airport infrastructure prevents cargo aircraft from delivering directly to the customer. In addition, just-in-time logistics is hampered by traffic jams and poor road conditions. We have a vision for the future where cargo can be delivered rapidly to any location, near or far. Recent advances in electric powertrain, machine perception, and autonomous flight enable new possibilities for logistics. Elroy Air is developing an autonomous vertical takeoff and landing aircraft transporting 200 to 500 pounds of cargo over a 300 mile range by air. Elroy Air is a small team of experts in aerospace, UAVs, industrial design, supply chain, and robotics. We have designed a complete aircraft and cargo solution and have already built working prototypes of our cargo handling, ground navigation systems, and subscale aircraft. Elroy Air's system brings new flexibility to express logistics, enabling rapid aerial delivery of cargo to businesses worldwide. So here's our problem statement. Amazon has built a global expectation for lightning fast deliveries of goods. This applies to both individual consumers and to commercial customers. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Um, this applies to both individual consumers and to commercial customers. Um, our, co our company is following um, the lead of, lead of leading commercial um, logistics companies and finding new ways to address that demand. Okay, so this is the aircraft we're building. Uh, we call it the EA EA-1. It takes large quantities of cargo directly from A to B by air, no roads or airport infrastructure required. So here's some details on how we're making that happen. Two key points I'll dig into on this slide. Number one, we found a customer-driven need for 500 kilometers of range, but that's not going to happen on today's pure electric EV tall systems using today's battery technology. Instead, our aircraft is hybrid electric today with the capability of being pure electric tomorrow. Number two, it's not enough to take a passenger VTOL aircraft, throw in some packages, and assume you're going to get high throughput logistics. With this in mind, we're just building an aircraft specifically for cargo uh, with full air and ground autonomy for this vehicle. So this is, this is the vision. Cargo to customers, no airports required. Bypassing roads and traffic anywhere in the world. In this image, here's what it'll look like when we're on approach to a distribution center. So how will we make, will, how will we make this vision a reality? We're taking a phased approach, starting by working with government, then moving to international customers and running commercial logistics in the US later. This approach gives us the fastest early paths to market while mitigating CERT and airspace integration timeframe risks. I'm gonna skip ahead here. So here's our work to date. And since starting the company in 2016, our team has been quickly working on building, developing, and testing our aircraft. We've also been gathering customer feedback to assure we're building the right tools for the job. We're now into deep into detailed design, and in fact, tooling is kicking off this month. So what's ahead for us? in the last 17 seconds. Our team is pushing hard to get the full-scale aircraft flying next year. At the end of next year, we'll start into pilot flights with customers and certifying our cargo UAV. We see now is the moment, the technologies are there, and government NGOs and... <sighs> Sorry, everybody. Skip to the end. Some final thoughts. We see now is the moment, the technologies are there, and government NGOs and commercial logistics all see 
eVTOL as a game changer. So let's uplift logistics. Thanks, everybody. That's great, Clint. Uh, Raj, questions or comments? I think uh, cargo is a great place to start for these sorts of things, so um, in favor of that. What are you thinking you'll be able to charge as a premium for your service, given the, the speed and convenience you're hoping to deliver? Um, so we're looking to start with the same type of charges that um, feeder airlines are charging today for, um, for, for moving cargo from A to B. So, um, you know, we're, a lot of these, like for example, a Cessna caravan takes, a lot of these flights get like $2,500 per flight. We think we can come in, in under that number because we're bypassing airport infrastructure and also offering a value add to the customer of bypassing a truck on the flip side by being to deliver straight to that, straight to a, for example, a remote customer's parking lot. So we're going to be sticking with feeder and matching their rates to start. Any questions from the audience? Paul, comments? Uh, yeah, just. Uh, are you looking to operate the aircraft as well and then just sort of charge a service or actually sell the aircraft to logistics? Yeah, that's a great companies? question. Um, we're actually seeing that there's you know, opportunities to you know, basically build up a service business by selling aircraft to the beginning. And so at, at the beginning of the business, we're actually looking to sell into, into military. Um, there's huge opportunities there to take um, helicopter pilots out of harm's way. And uh, we see that as a, as a way to, to help build that services business and to log a lot of flight hours on the vehicle in some of the toughest conditions imaginable. And second question is, have you had any discussions with logistics providers, military, any end users that have, you know, that you? Yeah, so um, the uh, vehicle grew, grew quite a bit because of that. Um, and so, you know, we've been talking to um, basically all the major logistics providers. Um, we started conversations with the Marines right from the very beginning because we saw opportunities with them. And we've been, you know, in this mode of, you know, every couple of weeks we're checking in with customers around whether or not we're building the right thing and finding touch points to show them tech and prototypes before we go to tooling. And Chris, what is your... Chris, uh, sorry, go ahead. Christopher? Uh, yeah, I was just curious, um, why, why the hybrid approach? Why not just go completely combustion? And of the electric piece of those, I think you said 500 kilometers distance, mm -hmm. how much of that is um, uh, the electric side? Yeah, so we're only flying on the electric portion of the system for basically the first uh, minute and a half in um, you know, basically fairly ideal flight conditions to, uh, to like six minutes of flight if we need to sustain hover. So worst case is six minutes of electric flight on either side, and then there's a combustion engine on board that with a, uh, with a, with a generator fixed to that combustion engine, so we're completely decoupled from infrastructure other than fuel. Brilliant. We need to go back a slide, possibly, back to the beginning. That one's pinged up early. There we go. So I'll fire this off. Now, the only way I'm going to keep this sensible is to have it timed. So that's what we're going to do. It's going to run through itself. Um, basically, we've been around since 2014. The company was formed uh, with a basic idea that we're going to go after the urban air mobility market. So we formed within weeks of uh, Zunum. But there are some core problems here. Noise, cost of operation, social acceptance, and safety concerns. These are the major hindrances to why we don't fly to work for the majority of us today. We created the BIHA, which is the bioelectric hybrid aircraft. It's a combination of propulsion systems. And as you can see, and as you've heard for the last couple of days, this market could be huge. It's worth 280 odd billion. Um, that said, there is a progress and a stepping stone to get there. We believe that starting out with a fixed wing, short takeoff and landing proposition, uh, is the way that we can do that because the regulators, the air traffic management networks can get their heads around it and we can start demonstrating some of these models. So what are we going to basically do? We're basically creating an aircraft uh, which is a triple box wing. Now a triple box wing is designed, painted, short takeoff and landing, it lifts an awful lot. We are not going into high atmosphere, we do not need to be going super fast. As long as we're quicker than a helicopter, that's great. It's a multi-role asset, it is a load carrier whether that's pink bodies, equipment, logistics, et cetera, doesn't matter. It's got a hybrid propulsion system for the hybrid engine. Uh, that is a joint venture separate company we set up with ProDrive, motorsport company. That's a 300 horsepower hybrid propulsion unit. So the first aircraft that we started with was the, was the Bihar H1. That is, again, electric to take off, saves the emissions, the noise, the fuel burn, switched to internal combustion engine. 
We then, at Farnborough this year, we announced the E1, fully electric version of the aircraft. We can fly from London to Belfast, fully electric, because we can carry an awful lot of batteries. What we didn't announce is that we can then fly back from Belfast to London on the same charge. We've got the M1, which is a turboprop. Again, with a turboprop, 2,000 horsepower in the back, we lift over 10 tons of payload. It is huge. A couple of weeks ago, we announced the air tanker variant, which is a firefighting tanker drone, very appropriate to what's been going on here of late. And again, it is a high payload carrying autonomous drone that can go and get hold of fires at a very young embryonic stage. 6% of US fossil fuel emissions every year from forest fires. Let's cap that by half. This is where we're at at the moment. We've got scale model testing ongoing. Because we will volume out before we payload out, we are now basically making the tube bigger. So over the next 12 months, we're going to optimize the aircraft to basically give us the load that we're looking for. As I said, we started 2014. It's been a hell of a journey. We've had awards in 2016. Uh, we designed the hybrid propulsion system. That is a direct fit replacement for a Lycoming six-cylinder engine. 300 horsepower will be jet A fuel or biofuel. Uh, and that will fit to any aircraft. We're basically now in the process of the optimization of the aircraft. Prototyping will begin for that flight propulsion system in 2019. We hope to have our full-size prototype aircraft, which will be the turboprop variant by 2021. We expect to be certified on that variant by 2023, hybrid certified by 2027, fully electric certified by 2030. That's our view of the market. And the uh, tier one aerospace provider that is creating a full one megawatt electric propulsion system is going to be going into the back of the aircraft. So who are we? We've basically got about 100 years worth of aerospace experience behind the company. Uh, myself, as you know, from the commercial market. Uh, ben Evans, he's doing all the aero work right now. He is the guy who's been designed the Bloodhound land speed record car, which will go at 1,000 miles an hour. It's an utter lunatic machine. Um, but basically, if you can keep a car on the ground at 1,000 miles an hour, you're a very good guy to be optimizing the flight dynamic of our aircraft. So he's a great addition to the team. We obviously want to expand, bring in more engineers. We're basically looking at a funding requirement for a certified airplane around about 50 million, um, but we're looking to create the first flying prototype for 10. That's obviously going to be the first test aircraft. In terms of our milestones, uh, we have advised UK government within three years. We've won awards. We've caused major tier one aerospace companies to completely change strategy and vision in the UK especially. And basically what we're looking to do now is really push this up a notch um, because we've been struggling to get some of the PR contact that some of our competitors have had in the market for a while. So we want to build the aircraft now. We want to demonstrate the routes. We want to show you what regional air mobility can look like from a managed, sensible platform to start with. Dean Sigler uh, made some interesting comments about our platform, um, and I think he's right. I mean, we are basically looking at this from a different perspective to solve. But here's a quick intro, a little bit more about what we do. Questions? Comments? Have you uh, flown the aircraft yet? Do you have a model of it? Flying? Scale models. Scale yeah, we models. had scale models. Um, basically, we were looking at uh, how the surfaces operate at slow speed. We're using vectored thrust off the duct. Um, the main aircraft will be able to take off and land in 200 meters, so that adds some interesting uh, challenges. Um, 16 degrees angle of attack at 40 knots for a 2,500 kilo airplane. We're still lifting. Uh, she doesn't stall. So there's, there's an awful lot of exciting stuff we're working on right now. How fast and how loud are you targeting? You mentioned faster than a helicopter, but roughly what's the range? Absolutely. Um, it's about 160, 180 knots. That will depend on this optimization of how big we want to make the tube, uh, because we volume out before we payload out. 
Um, that's, but that's miles per hour? That's not, sorry. Um, so we expect to be faster than helicopter. In terms of noise, the aircraft will be less than 60 decibels. So we expect to be a good 30 to 40% less noise than a Pilatus PC-12. Again, that will enable us to operate in certain environments, like, for example, London City Airport, 10.30 at night, closed, due to noise. So if we can operate in some of these environments and show that this can work, then obviously that then opens up the opportunity as you add the electrification into the whole process, the hybridization, the business economics in the aircraft just gets better and better. As a financial investor, I noticed a large requirement for funds for this to all happen. So what should I expect as a return? Um, it depends what your immediate appetite is. If you're in for the long um, term, we're obviously uh, focused by the customer options for the asset. At the moment, we have a lot of military asset, uh, a lot of military interest for the vehicle. Um, that could mean we could go military certification, which will make a huge amount of cost saving versus going down the pure commercial certification route. Equally, if you're interested purely in the hybrid propulsion, we have the standalone JV, whereby that engine in its own right is going to have a huge market in its own right. So if you wanted a three-year exit window opportunity, maybe back just the engine. Um, so that's the joint venture we have with ProDrive. Um, but Great. really, it depends what your, your appetite is. Brilliant. Hi, I'm Greg Obi, CEO of Kerr Avionics. We are a R&D engineering uh, firm located outside Portland, Oregon. Everybody here has been frustrated by delays caused by fog. Kerr Avionics uh, technology boosts the performance of approach guidance systems by 300% in fog. Put another way, a pilot approaching uh, a landing zone that's aided by ILS uh, enhanced Kerr technology can see the landing zone runway and approach lights three times sooner than uh, the same a pilot that only has infrared technology. Um, our 300% uh, improvement has been independently validated in lab and field tests. We took the results of those tests, went to the, the, the leading players in our verticals, uh, the, the airports, the lighting OEMs, airframe OEMs, EVS OEMs, uh, end users, helicopters, uh, box carriers, commercial, business aviation. Uh, universally uh, favorable responses from each of them. We then went to the FAA with the data. They uh, responded by offering us a uh, cooperative research uh, uh, agreement, uh, which uh, we hope to uh, schedule for uh, later this fall. We've reached a uh, TRL level five in uh, technological readiness. Uh, briefly, the problem that we're solving, the FAA and European uh, aviation requires um, minimums to be established prior to a pilot uh, completing an approach. Uh, the problem is that the industry has spent billions of dollars uh, on infrared lighting because the airports have uh, field operations based on, on incandescent lights incandescent lights and infrared light have poor performance penetration in fog and haze and other uh, obscurants so that the, the, the end users are not particularly happy with the performance of the current technology out there. Uh, among other, you know, because it causes uh, departure delays, landing delays, holding patterns and uh, uh, diversions. The incandescent lights also have other problems. They're high maintenance, they're energy efficient, and they're expensive. So much so that Congress has mandated the FAA to modernize U.S. airports uh, by replacing the incandescent lights with LEDs. Part of the purpose of the uh, CRADA with Kerr Avionics is to uh, finalize specifications for the deployment of LEDs on on airport runways and approach lights. Just briefly how, it's, how our technology works. Uh, we modulate the um, LED lights on the ground by pulsing them uh, in a synchronized fashion with a sensor or, or a multi-sensor camera on board the aircraft that picks up a, the, the pulse and then it, then it takes another image without the pulse, transmits those two images to our processing software, which 
basically performs a Where's Waldo uh, exercise and can pinpoint the exact location of the LED lights within a, a foot of certainty. Then takes, uh, uh, transposes uh, that image up on a HUD or another display for, for the pilot and establishes the exact location uh, of, of the runway. Important to note that there's no new infrastructure required, only modest afford affordable uh, modifications both on the ground and in the aircraft. Uh, briefly, this is uh, just fog. The, our technology can pick up that, uh, that LED light in the distance. We have a declutter feature represented here where with our declutter feature, it eliminates all the lights except for the landing zone for the pilot. Uh, our business model on the ground, we work with the lighting uh, OEMs uh, to, uh, with an upfront license fee of $120,000 and a uh, royalty of 10% uh, for each uh, LED uh, embedded with uh, current technology. Uh, in the air, we work with our uh, client uh, enhanced vision system OEMs, again with an upfront fee and royalties. Trustable mark is a billion two. We have a great team. Uh, we'll be working with uh, the uh, FAA for the rest of the year. Uh, we think this technology has broad application beyond just what I've been talking about. Uh, there's another, uh, because LEDs can be coded, uh, we can, uh, the, the LEDs can send a message to the pilot that says, uh, Indiana Jones, this is runway 128A, please land here, don't land on the taxiway. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Paul? Uh, have you, um, that's good, I'm trying to think of a good question here. I'll, I'll, I'll hand it off to it, uh, what, do you, what do you think of the market opportunity here, right? If um, uh, it's a problem here in the city, but uh, that 1.2 billion number, is that based off all the runways in the world or only the runway specific to foggy conditions and such? No, that's, it's, it's, that's only the United States and Europe, and it only applies to uh, the lighting companies, it, what I was talking about there, the, 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 the lighting units, and the EVS system sold on, on fixed wing, you know, commercial uh, and uh, helicopter and um, uh, general aviation. The, if you take some of the other applications such as, you know, ground-based trucking, uh, you know, for autonomous vehicles where it's positioning, then, you know, we haven't included that in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the total addressable market. Raj? Does this replace Cat 3 landings or is this a supplement no. to that? No, uh, the, with a Cat Three, you know, auto land coming into San Francisco from Paris, you're gonna you can land in San Francisco, but once you get there uh, in zero zero, how do you how do you find your way to the gate? If if we, our technology would supplement that by having the taxiway lights coded to communicate, you, you the, the uh, help uh, guide that the, you know the plane directly to the gate. Hello, my name is uh, Benoit Snella, and I will present you uh, and share the thoughts of uh, what we're doing at LISA and what we think about uh, versatility and efficiency can benefit to the sustainable aviation. So during the last two days, uh, we've heard a lot of good ideas and expertise regarding the future of avi aviation um, to allow people to uh, spend less time in transportation. Uh, what is proposed is um, for in-city flights, we have a whole new urban air mobility, and for intercontinental flights, we have supersonic aircraft. Regional um, flights were also addressed with electric aircraft. I want to go a little bit further on this kind of flights because if we can access to airports, airfields, as well as seashore, lakes, and river, it improves a lot the number of destinations you can have access. And with this uh, improved number of locations, you improve the routes for regional aircraft uh, without more uh, infrastructure. You just have to do with what is existing. So Lisa is a French aircraft manufacturer. We are devoted to create cutting edge technology and aircraft to the benefits of uh, the quality of people's life without jeopardizing the, um, uh, our planets. What we do is we create aircraft that doesn't benefits, uh, doesn't need a lot of infrastructure, 
uh, our design is energy efficient. We lower the energy needed so that we can be adapted to um, a clean energy propulsion system. And for the wellness of the passenger, we, we try to, to do something bigger cabin, and we try to make the, the journey uh, uh, pleasant from the beginning to, to the end. Um, we've proven this technology with the first aircraft we've designed. Akoya is a two-seater aircraft, designs, um, it has 10 years of R&D behind him. Um, this aircraft uh, flies on water, ground, and snow, and this is what we call the multi-access technology, because with the capability of landing of water, ground, and snow, without any modification on, on the aircraft. This provides a um, brand new experience to, to the passenger. The main innovation in this multi-access is the c -Fols. We are the first and only manufacturer to handle the hydropulse technology on, uh, on an aircraft. Uh, the benefits of hydrofoils is mainly it's really easy to handle. So you don't feel the bumps on the waves. You have a bigger waves capability and great aesthetics. Uh, the aesthetics is um, the clean lines is not only for the cool design of this aircraft, but it also lowers the drags and provides great aerodynamics for the, for the aircraft. The versatility of this aircraft is provided also uh, by the, the landing gear, what we call skis in. It's a retractable landing gear equipped with skis and combined with hydrofoils. With just one button, the pilot has the capability to choose where we want the land. And the last feature is the folding wings, with the, which provide also versatility on the ground. You can access to narrow places and ease the storage. Uh, with the benefits of this um, background, we want to, and we are now scaling up our technology to uh, bigger aircraft. It will be six seats and 19 seats aircraft with electric propulsion and uh, hybrid energy. And this will address the regional fly markets like business jet, commuter, or utility to provide point-to-point -point journey from a lot of uh, different kinds of surface. What I want to do now is share with you first uh, some snapshot of what kind of uh, journey uh, you can have with this uh, business version of um, this aircraft. So imagine you want to spend a weekend, very special weekend with your family, but you can't afford not working this, this weekend. So you book your order or you make your aircraft come at um, the Yacht Club in uh, Chicago, for example, and you board just behind the Yacht Club. Then, after takeoff from Michigan Lake, you can have a drink and uh, appreciate the view from the Sky's View living room. Your first leg will stop uh, in Virginia, for example, where you will assist to an art auction and attend to, to the evening. After the, the evening, you will take off at, after midnight, and you will be able to spend a relaxing night in the quiet room and private room, and you wake up with the sunrise just above the Gulf of Mexico, where you'll be able to spend the whole journey between sun baths, swimming, but also working because you have a lot of work to do. At the end of the day, you can appreciate um, you've finish your work, you have spent a nice weekend with your family, and on the following morning, after last night on board, you'll be able to be dropped in New York just before your family goes back to Chicago. Thank you. You said hybrid, uh, hybrid electric. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Uh, our idea is to have an electric engine, and we've worked before to have um, different kind of solution depending on um, the capability. We can have battery, but that's not enough to have a long range. So we'll have also, um, our idea is to have hydrogen fuel cell. Hydrogen can have clean energy because you can generate hydrogen with hydrolysis, and it's only, we only need water and electricity for that. Uh, could you touch on the unit economics and pricing structure um, around this? for like the six-seater? For the six-seater, it will be around four million euros, but for the bigger aircraft, it will be uh, more than 15 million euros for, um, for the aircraft. 
Yeah, that's for the aircraft, but then yeah. like charging for flights? No, we didn't build the model yet. Yeah, the, my question is, Ian, what stage of development are you in? And secondarily, how do I get to live in a house like the one you showed? <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't. <laughs> what stage of development are you in with the, with the aircraft? With this uh, fir uh, second aircraft. So the first aircraft is about to be certified and it will be delivered next uh, year. It's in the live sport market. Um, and the second aircraft, we have early design because in-house we have capability of uh, CFD engineering. So while we were doing R&D on the technology, we were scaling up at the same time. So now it's really the early design stage for the bigger aircraft. And did I understand correctly, you're going after the business sector, but with a two-seater for the initial one? Why no, yet, no, that's really leisure, sport aviation with a two-seater. Great, thanks. Scott, I'm a space farmer. I'm working hard to make sure that one day we're going to be able to grow food in space and anywhere on Earth. Going to space is hard. It's expensive. And it's a lot of work. But very soon, and sooner than we think, there's going to be a lot of people traveling, visiting, living, and moving to space. So producing food is a fundamental thing that we need to solve, especially when you consider how much food we actually eat. As an example, It'll, to, go to, to travel to Mars, it's going to take a three-year round-trip journey. In that three years, for a crew of four people, they're going to consume three meals a day, which is 24,000 pounds of food that need to be carried on that ship. And to put that in perspective, SpaceX is looking to put uh, a human, mi human mission to Mars in 2024 with a capacity to carry 200 passengers. So whether or not this timeline is correct, this is 1.2 million pounds of food required to feed those 200 people. So we have a problem that we need to solve. So what are we doing about it and why am I here? I'm a serial entrepreneur with a lifelong passion for the aerospace industry. My company, Orbital Farm, is designing and building a closed loop farming system that can be built anywhere on Earth. In the future, we'll feed people on the moon, on Mars, but today, we'll build farms to feed people here. Instead of spending the next 15 to 20 years raising capital and, and, uh, and doing research and development projects without any revenue, our development pathway is commercial. While our long-term mission for space farming will drive the technologies we select, the optimizations, and the design, what we, sorry, and the design principles, today we're going to build the most productive farms on the planet. We're going to feed people and we're going to we're going to provide fresh fr produce for uh, fresh produce and fresh vegetables, fresh fish to restaurants, to hotels and catering companies, and we're going to work together with the aerospace community and the space ad advocates around the world. Everyone needs to eat three meals a day, and half of your plate should be vegetables. Keep that in mind. An orbital farm is complex. It, but it combines existing commercial technologies of aquaculture, of hydroponics, of anaerobic digestion, gas bioprocessing, water treatment, desalination, solar energy, electrolysis, and robotics. Each of these technologies are very well established, they're well understood, and they're scaled to large commercial facilities. But once these are combined, this creates a system which is sustainable and closed loop. This is not complexity without purpose. The productivity benefits of a system like this are huge.
One thing we're going to need to get really great at doing is figuring out how to grow food inside tubes. Just like rockets on, 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 or on an airplane. What about a retiring 7047? This is a 20 meter diameter tube. What if we could transform this into a flying farm? What if that this could be used to provide food and, and, and food support and relief for um, places all around the world? Over the last 20 years, we've had an average of 408 natural disasters per year. That's nearly double the amount in the previous 20. Fresh, healthy food and water are some of the most critical, time-sensitive elements needed in these situations. Food is hard to get, it's hard to transport, and, and it can become spoiled very rapidly. Very rarely uh, does it arrive in a timely manner. And a flying farm that could fly to these disaster locations or these distressed areas and produce food at the same time and expertise to, to be able to build their own uh, food systems. Another application that's possible is providing fresh food production at airport hub hubs around the world. We will deploy farms at airports all over the globe, providing business jets, airlines, with the freshest, healthiest, most local food possible. With food being one of the most criticized aspects of air travel, it's hard to get right, but it starts with great tasting, fresh ingredients. We will partner and develop and deploy orbital farms around the world, giving private aviation and airlines better tasting, fresh food, removing logistics issues, price fluctuations, and consistency problems that exist within the food preparation sector. We must, we must improve the customer experience together, and, and we can do that. So I'm here today to, to, to discuss this with investors, to meet aerospace companies, and to gauge people's opinions. So I, I look you. forward to conversations. Thanks. Raj or Chris? Um, I applaud your vision. Uh, I can see why you'd want to take a farm to a disaster area for the long-term benefits, but why would you take it on a flight, a uh, transcom flight of six hours? What's the benefit of that versus loading fresh food on at the start? So, so uh, the, the reality of the flying farm is a research and development project that we're going to need to undertake, but can be, but can be a facility that let's say a hurricane goes through the Caribbean, because there's a few of those that happen each year, it decimates an island, we can, we can fl have that aircraft come land and start begin producing produce um, immediately and, and continually while it's, while it's sitting there. Um, so it's, this is not a six hour long flight um, hopper. Or alternatively, it could be a retired aircraft that's coming out of service and you have a giant tube that um, that would otherwise be sold for scrap metal that could be left and deployed. Uh, where are you at in development of a, of a prototype? And for earth-based farms, what's the benefit of these farms over conventional farms today? So there's a, there's a, that's a nuanced question. So we have a fairly, um, we, our business model is to have, we have a holding company and we have individual project-based um, assets underneath that. So we have investable projects uh, a farm in Namibia, in the middle of a desert, uh, which is a near closed loop system. So th that's ready to be invested today. So if you, if, if, if you want to invest a million euros, we've got, we've got an asset that's, uh, that's looking to be invested in. Um, if we're talking about an individual uh, uh, farm to be located at, say, an airport um, around here, we could have a farm deployed. Uh, we have a technology that has been that there's over 70 of them in operation, and they've been operating since 2005. They're two times more efficient than any greenhouse, and they'll sit there and produce 250 heads of lettuce every single day. That could be could be given to a, um, a, a private aviation company and and uh, and produce, yeah, right away. So from a prototyping standpoint, um, we're we're at the stage where uh, we have investable assets, and we're slowly doing the research and development over the 15 years, not one big, huge farm that, that you saw there. Great. Great. Thanks. Panel are discussing. So this is the public vote. Please, judges, do not be swayed by this. Uh, while you're talking, Raj, do you have any uh, summing up comments you'd like to make? 
Uh, I think it's gratifying to see the level of diversity of the, of the startups that, uh, that you brought here today. So kudos to you for that. Um, I, I love the idea of the orbital farm. I still don't quite understand the, the use case for the JetBlue Mint service. That's what piqued my interest. But uh, certainly putting farms in the right places to be able to grow food effectively is a, is a great idea. Paul, any thoughts? Yeah, um, orbital science is just super curious. When you're at a party, how do you introduce yourself? Like, hi, I'm, I'm a space farmer, or what, what normally is the response? <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, obviously very interesting and dynamic uh, range of ideas. Um, uh, certainly, if you could do farming uh, more efficiently, that, that, that would be a pretty big uh, innovation. And uh, I do like the, the um, uh, cargo, flying cargo idea as well. I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. Chris, any summing up comments? Uh, I'll just echo Raj a bit. I mean, uh, very unique companies here. Um, I, w I wasn't expecting this. Um, so uh, I guess impressed by the overall diversity and um, hopefully look forward to seeing uh, farms on Mars in the near future. OK. Do the judges between you, which actually, should we do this, um, you know, like they do on uh, Shark Tank? Do we each want to pick, or not Shark Tank, uh, America's Got Talent? You can each pick one in turn. Paul, who is your winner? Obviously, I'd, it'd be good if two of you at least could pick the same one. Just to... I thought the idea that was most reasonably executed in a short period of time uh, would be the Elroy Air thing, because I think there's an, an immediate need for a market for that amongst distribution centers. And there's, it's, it's lower risk than the, other, than the other technologies, which involve people and you know other things um, uh, other than that I would love a uh, space uh, farming you know farm in my backyard so I need you <laughs> I didn't know you had a space pl uh, planet uh, so your your choice is Elroy Air Chris yeah I'm gonna go with Elroy Air as well uh, largely due to the uh, markets ready for it it's probably the largest market opportunity there and um, uh, yeah, moving moving cargo makes sense right now. So we, uh, yeah, it's ready. Raj? I think my colleagues are being far too uh, practical about this. Um, I'm absolutely going to go for orbital farm. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's definitely the way of the future. And the winner of the public vote, this is very Floridian as well, where the second place public vote is Faraday. So uh, Neil, if you'd like to come.